evening to you. You're watching Prime Time News on News First. I'm Chaturang Hapuarachi. And I'm Bernadine Jai Singh. A very good evening to you. The Met Department has once again predicted rainfall exceeding 100 millimeters in a number of districts. A comprehensive story on the weather forecast comes your way later on in the news bulletin. But before that, let's take a look at the headlines. Rainfall exceeding 100 millimeters predicted in several parts of the island. Hartals in the north in support of the chief minister of the northern province. Mismanagement of garbage, the cause of dengue. Minister John Amaratunga regrets using unbefitting words at journalists. In a weather advisory issue this evening, the Med Department predicts showery conditions to continue in the southwestern parts of the country. Thunder showers will occur at times in the western, Sabaragamwa, central, southern and northwestern provinces, particularly during the mornings and nights. Fairly heavy rainfalls exceeding 100 millimetres can be expected in certain areas, particularly in the Colombo, Kalutara, Ratnapura, Gaul and Mathura districts. Showers or thunder showers could also occur at several places in the Uva province, especially in the Ampara and Batiklo districts during the afternoons. There may be temporary localised strong winds during thunder showers and the general public is kindly required requested to take adequate precaution to minimize damage caused by lightning. In light of the weather forecast in the Ratnapur area, News First spoke to the Assistant Director at the Disaster Management Center, Pradeep Kodipili, with regards to the risk of flooding. Pradeep Kodipili informed that a preliminary warning has been issued to the people in the area of the Kukuleganga Reservoir and surrounding areas. They have been advised to be ready to evacuate if there is an emergency situation once the sluice gates are opened. Every residents of Singhakat along the Kandy Colombo railway line claim that there is a risk of landslides occurring. Moving on with more local news, a hartal was staged in the Jaffna and Mulatiu areas today in support of the Chief Minister of the Northern Province, C.V. Vigneshwaran, against whom 21 members of the Northern Provincial Council handed in a letter of no confidence. Transport services in the Jaffna and Mulitivu areas came to a standstill today due to the Hartal, while shops in the area also remained closed. Our correspondents also reported that several schools did not function today as the attendance was very poor. When inquired, Northern Province Director of Education S. Udaya Kumar stated that attendance was poor in most schools. Officials at the Jaffna University also confirmed that educational activities came to a standstill at the university today due to the absence of students and professors. Three protests were staged in the Jaffna, Kilinochi and Vaunia areas in support of Chief Minister C.V. Vigneshwaran who took stern action to crack down against corruption. Meanwhile, M.K. Sivajalingam and two others handed in a letter to the governor of the northern province today expressing their support for the Chief Minister. The letter was signed by 15 members of the Northern Provincial Council, including the Chief Minister. P. Igaranation, against whom alleged charges were levelled, also signed the letter supporting the Chief Minister. Last night, the Governor met with a group of your party members. Is there any special reason for this? There was no special request from the Governor. He did not ask me to show a majority. However, I did send a letter to him bearing the signatures of 15 members who support me. I can state with confidence that I have 50% of the people with me. 15 of the 30 TNA members have signed the documents which support me. There are only 14 in the opposition. Dharmalingam is currently overseas and that is the current situation. Several members of the Northern Provincial Council met me and handed in a no-confidence motion against the Chief Minister. Thereafter, another group arrived and gave a letter expressing their confidence in the Chief Minister. I cannot reveal the number of people who have signed these documents. As the governor, I have decided to act in accordance with the law. At this point of time, the government cannot take a decision on this. There is democracy in the country and we should act accordingly. President Maitri Palasiri Sena presided over a discussion on the progress of the development programs in the northern province on the 12th of June. With security levels being tight on the day, media was not allowed to cover the proceedings. News First has received the coverage of the meeting today. 
The meeting focused on the new investments that are to be done in the northern province as well as the reduction of unemployment in the region. There has been 1,000 acres of land, sir, uh, given by the POI in the Manpuram area. And we have pretty many instructions, sir, to look after the land and survey it. And once that is done, sir, there are a lot of investors from abroad or we come to Sri Lanka, as Honorable Mahmi Sirandra uh, mentioned. So if that can be done, sir, the entire unemployment problem in the North is solved. But graduates will be given employment. There were a lot of people are coming from. Canada people have contacted me from all over the world, sir. They have to come and uh, invest. And because you are giving project uh, so much of tax free allowances, sir, uh, tax free concessions to the project. So therefore, sir, I just want to uh, mention to your excellency that I am going ahead with that, sir. I will report back to you once the infrastructure is in the works. The prefabricated private housing that are to be set up in the northern province were also discussed at the meeting. The prefabricated houses are the latest. You know, all the investment oriented, all the new investments into the country, they come on uh, prefabrication. Prefabrication, one thing, it is stronger and quicker, right? And that is the latest uh, this thing. In other countries, in the developed countries, now no masonry. Buildings, all are pre Because the lack of sand and bricks, the entire erosion in the southern region is due to this erosion due to the lack of, uh, of uh, pre filing the sand. So there has to be some alternative solution brought for the projects that is all over the world. In Dubai, in Australia, in South Africa, in all the countries in the world. The new way of projecting any houses is going to be prefabricated. I just want to bring that back. Addressing a meeting held at the Presidential Secretariat today, President Maitabal Sirisena emphasized that the country should not go through a shortage of rice for any given reason. The meeting was aimed at looking into the stocks of rice in warehouses and the possible demand for rice in the coming months. President Sirisena had called for the meeting after receiving information of a possible shortage of rice in the market. The president emphasized the need of maintaining rice stocks at warehouses consistent with the demand for it and said that the Ministry of Trade should continuously monitor the stocks and the demand. Furthermore, the attention of the president was drawn towards the difficulties faced by the consumers due to the price of rice exceeding the maximum retail prices set by the government. He also inquired into the enforcement of laws against retailers selling rice at higher prices. Discussions also focused on the strategy that should be adopted by the private sector when importing rice. The menace of dengue is once again raising its head in the country due to the torrential rains and the piling up of garbage on street corners. Over the past year, there have been over 62,000 reported dengue patients in the country. This was the situation witnessed in the Periyamulla, Depahala and Kato areas in Nigambo. <laughs> Many environmental issues have cropped up due to the improper disposal of garbage. Rain hit Ratnapura in another area facing a garbage crisis. Our cameras were able to capture multiple dengue breeding grounds in the Maharagama and Buralasgamo areas. While garbage piles up in many of the major cities, the hospitals around the country are inundated with dengue patients. According to officials at the Nigambo Base Hospital, all beds of the special dengue unit set up at the hospital have been occupied by dengue patients. A majority of these patients are in a serious condition. The Nigambo Base Hospital has around 600 dengue patients who are receiving in-house treatment. However, it has only 200 beds. Due to the increase in the number of patients, the Ministry of Health has advised hospital officials to admit patients into the first story of a new building being built for the hospital. Over 450 dengue patients are currently receiving treatment at the IDH hospital. The Ministry of Health has taken the necessary steps to allocate the necessary doctors and resources for the hospital. The Ministry has also instructed the hospitals in Thalangam, Vathara, IDH and Kalubovila to act in coordination with each other and pool in their resources. 115 dengue patients were admitted to the Kalubovila Teaching Hospital during the month of June alone, while a total of 924 dengue patients have been admitted to the hospital since the start of this year. 
Meanwhile, a program was launched today to call on all citizens and state organizations to devote one hour a week for the purpose of dengue eradication. The program is being spearheaded by the Presidential Task Force on Dengue Eradication. Who is responsible for the collection and proper disposal of garbage? Is it the politicians or the officials? Our ministry is the worst affected by the garbage issue. Valuable lands belonging to the UDA and the Land Development Corporation are being misused by the provincial councils and municipal councils. The provincial councils, the Colombo Municipal Council and other bodies have failed to act in an organized manner. This is their responsibility. If tomorrow we stop them from dumping garbage on our sites, then these heroes who make outrageous statements will have nowhere to dump their garbage. Residents of flats should take up the responsibility of disposing their own garbage. In the future, the UDA will not accept plans for developments unless they provide us with a plan on how they will manage the garbage. <laughs> We are all responsible for this garbage issue. We see there is dirt on the hands of both the people who transport this garbage as well as those who are in charge of garbage. Tragedies like Mithotamulla occur because of the wrong deeds of those who are in charge of collecting garbage and those who are responsible for creating garbage dumps. This can be seen as manslaughter. Charges should be filed against the people responsible. <laughs> There are around 2 million lunch sheets that come into Colombo on a daily basis. All of this was dumped in Mithurmulla. Some of the government and private sector employees transport their garbage in cars and dump it in Colombo. The garbage collected by the Colonnao Municipal Council after being bribed also ended up in Mithurmulla. This can be clearly seen because when the Mithurmulla dump collapsed, garbage began piling up in areas such as Kaduela, Mahargama and Aturgiriya. If this garbage was also not dumped in Mithurumulla, there is no reason for garbage to pile up in this manner. There is no point in scolding everyone. We need to figure out the cause of this problem. Provincial councils exist to collect the garbage. It is the government's job to either bury it or recycle it. There is a situation where we cannot combine these two tasks. The politicians don't have the backbone to go and tell these people to get things done. State officials are not dedicated enough to get this job done. The innocent people who are caught up in the middle are the worst affected. The people scold the politicians but the problems are caused by the officials. <laughs> Prime Minister Rani Vikramasinghe toured disaster affected areas once again today. The Prime Minister, who arrived in Morawak today, met with the people affected by the natural disasters and engaged in a discussion. Thereafter, the Prime Minister and the group accompanying him inspected the site of the Morawak landslide, which claimed the lives of 23 people. After inspecting the Purupitiya Bridge, the group also attended a discussion at the Kotapala Divisional Secretariat Office. Attention was focused on helping advanced level students whose notes and books had been washed away due to floods. We have not received the full estimates as yet. The Treasury told me that we will receive between 30 to 100 billion initially. We are due to receive aid as well. We need to safeguard these areas which are at risk of landslides. We need to resettle some of these people. We need to find new locations. We need to take defensive measures to stop further landslides in these areas. All this will cost us a great deal of money. The energy sector marred with impropriety was a point that was raised at a forum yesterday. As time goes by, the demand increases. More coal power plants will not be built and renewable energy plants will not be built. The only thing that will be built is temporary crude oil power plants. 
It is clear to us that the oil mafia is behind this plan for long-term coal power generators. By 2020, they would purchase electricity from these oil power plants at exorbitant prices and create a difficult situation, or they will have to commence power cuts. 2020 will be the year for elections, so we have a doubt whether this is a conspiracy aimed towards those events. <laughs> Convening a media briefing today, Minister John Amratunga provided an explanation into the incidents that led to the minister berating two members of the media. I summoned to my home in Kandana the volunteering group that was causing problems in Muturajavela. This was a private affair. I did not summon the media for this event. When I was leaving this discussion, two private media journalists came with their cameras and began asking questions for me. I told them not to ask questions and I told them the matter has been resolved and I also requested them to leave. Even when I was saying this, they tried to shout and create an issue. That is what I felt. When they didn't leave, I scolded them. I might have said one or two bad words in doing so and I apologize for it. As a minister, as an MP, I have faced the media for many years. Such an incident has never occurred in the past. This could have even been an attempt to obtain a visa for another country. With the incidents that happened in past, I can't help but wonder how significant this incident is. Sirius was attacked twice. They were burnt down and their property was destroyed. They set fire to Siata. I am saddened because individuals connected to the attack on Sirasa also spoke against this incident. Such actions don't take place now. I got Journalists inquired into whether one of his secretaries invited the journalists to the event. The Auditor General was grilled on an error in calculating percentages in his special audit report at the Presidential Commission of Inquiry today. News First, Zulfik Farsan has more details. When Counsel Chanaka De Silva was examining the evidence of Auditor General Garmini Vijay Singh, he pointed out that the Auditor General's calculation on percentages in the respective scope of investigation was flawed. However, the Auditor General pointed out that percentage calculation might have certain numerical errors as they were data obtained from the Central Bank of Sri Lanka. However, he said that his calculation on what was required from him were not flawed and that he stands by his calculations and the data that he vouches for in the Auditor General's special report. The error was highlighted in a graph of the special audit report in relation to the 29th of March 2015 bond auction. Council Chanaka De Silva, appearing for former Governor Mahindran, highlighted that 5 billion rupees has been used instead of 10 billion rupees in calculating the loss for one of the bonds issued on that day. The Auditor General said the auction was a mere sample used and it did not have an impact on the findings of the report. He highlighted that when probing the bond issuances, he considered the public outcry on the auctions in question. He said that it was observed that during the nine-year period from 2008 to 2015, 57% of bond issuances under the direct placement method was done at or below the existing market rates. Council pointed out that from 2008 to 2015, the total face value of bonds issued through auctions were 449 billion rupees. He said that this represented less than 10% of the 4,700 billion rupees raised through private placements during the nine-year period. The Collective of Citizens Organization took a blow at the former Secretary of Defense at a media briefing today.
Gotabe Rajapaksa was not summoned to the FCID to be questioned on Prabhakaran's death or about defeating the LTTE. He was summoned regarding a theft. If Gotabe Rajapaksa is summoned to the CID over the assassination of Lasanta Vikramatunga and the assault of Keith Noya, is it done according to the needs of the diaspora? Is it an issue in Geneva? Is the judicial process that is taking place to identify the people who opened fire and killed people in Ratupasala a need of the diaspora? I say this to Gotabe Rajapaksa and his associates. This is an issue of the people. The people want justice. The Mahindra Rajapaksa administration and Gotabe Rajapaksa use the military as their own mercenaries. We are pleased that the Rajapaksa faction, including Namal Rajapaksa, have thought about speaking on media freedom. Did Namal Rajapaksa comment on the way his uncle spoke about Lasanta Vikramatunga during his father's reign? He asked, who is Lasanta? That is what he said. He reprimanded the wife of late Lasanta. He termed them as excrement. Did Namal Rajapaksa speak to his uncle and say, do not speak like that. We must appear on behalf of media freedom. <laughs> We go in now for a short commercial break. Stay tuned to News First. Welcome back to the news. The first recorded sighting of the rare Amuras whale in Sri Lanka's waters is also the first from the central northern Indian Ocean. This exciting discovery was made and documented by Dr. Asha Divorce, marine biologist, who joined us here on News First earlier today. This sighting is significant on multiple levels. As yes, Sri Lankans, I mean, this is incredible. We get to add another whale to our list. Uh, it reminds us that uh, we live in one of these this teeming ocean basin. And on an international level, this species was only described back in 2003, which is very recent. Yeah. Um, and, you know, every piece of information we find out about it is like another piece of a jigsaw. Personally, I was uh, extremely excited once I realized what it was. We took all these photographs and I was thinking it looked a bit unusual. We realized this was something very different. And then I started to see the very characteristic marking. It's uh, really beautiful because it's got a very light underjaw on the right side, but on the left side it's black. On you know on its back it's got these beautiful patterns that are very characteristic of this species. And one of the things we are learning about these whales is they tend to be species that like shallow shelf waters, and this confirms that. Um, on the top left of its jaw, of its mouth, we, you can see an entanglement scar. And this tells us also, it gives us a piece of information about the threats that they face in these waters. The sighting was in February, but then it had to go through scientific verification, publications, um, before we could actually tell the world. And so the news is hotter off the press right now, which is great. It was terribly hard to keep a secret, but I'm so glad that we can now share it with Sri Lankans and the world. Disaster aid was distributed among those affected by the floods and landslide in the Wallasmilla Divisional Secretary, Secretary area today. Dry rations were distributed among 435 families at the Wallasmilla Divisional Secretariat by Minister Sajid Premadasa. I must state to the people affected that this government is committed to providing more relief and to uplifting the lives of the people than it was before. Certain members of the opposition are performing black magic in the North Central Province against the President and the Prime Minister. Such is the task of the opposition. Because that did not cause a change in the government, they took images of the President and the Prime Minister and performed black magic across all cemeteries in Horopatana. Such things will not change the people's lives. Only an election victory will change the government. Leave that aside, the misdeeds and help the people. Fourth Magistrate Lanka Jayaratna granted permission for parliamentarian Vimal Viravansa to travel overseas during the period from the 19th to the 23rd of this month. The magistrate issued the order after taking into consideration a request made by Vimal Viravansa pointing out that he needs to attend a defence conference organised by a university in Pakistan with a group including former President Mahindra Rajapaksa. Earlier, an order was issued by the Fort Magistrate preventing overseas travel for Vimal Viravansa without the permission of the courts over a case filed at the Colombo Fort Magistrate's court with regard to charges of misusing state vehicles during his tenure as the Minister of Housing and Construction. Venerable Ulapane Sumangalatera of the Anti-Corruption Front commented on the decision to allow Vimal Viravansa to fly to Pakistan for a defence summit. 
According to what we know, Vimal Viravansa has used three passports. One is his legal passport, the other was one he had made with false information and the third is his diplomatic passport. We need to know which passport court has allowed him to use. He has obtained permission to attend a defence seminar in Pakistan with the former president. According to what we know, the only knowledge Vimal Viravansa has in defence and related matters is through the 88-89 rebellion during which time he represented the party that was acting like terrorists. We have our doubts whether such a person attending a conference of this nature is aimed at taking the country down the path of militarization and not democracy. The strong ties between the Philippines and Sri Lanka were spoken of at the annual event to mark the 119th National Day of Republic of the Philippines held in Colombo last night. The event was organized by the Consulate of the Republic of the Philippines. The guest of honor was the Philippine Ambassador, His Excellency VVT Bandilo. Now the Filipino people live in a free democratic society full of hope for a better future. The Philippines highly values its steadfast relationship with Sri Lanka, a relationship which in the past century has put in place multiple agreements recognizing cooperation in such varied areas as cultural exchange, air transport, trade, taxation. Chief Guest Chandi Mavira Kodi, Minister of Skills Development and Vocational Training, also spoke of the strong ties between the two countries. Dulit Herat, Sri Lankan entrepreneur, Chief Executive Officer of Sri Lanka's largest e-commerce organization, Kapruka, and founder of the Grasshoppers Initiative, has been recognized as an Eisenhower Fellow by the Eisenhower Foundation. The Eisenhower Fellowship is one of the most prestigious fellowship experiences which connects a global network of dynamic change agents committed to creating a world more peaceful, prosperous and just. News First caught up with Dulit Herat this evening. I was delighted to hear about the Eisenhower Fellowship uh, this year being awarded to me. Major thanks goes to my parents and my family. And one of the reasons this Eisenhower Fellowship was given to me was that they recognized my new project, Grasshoppers. So Grasshoppers is all about letting everybody do e-commerce. I always call e-commerce a gold mine. So to mine the gold, you need some mining tools. Grasshoppers gives those tools to all the small and medium companies to get onto the e-commerce. I strongly believe e-commerce should not be something that is for giants like Amazon and eBay and even Kapruka in Sri Lanka. It should be something for everybody. Imagine when you are going down the street, how many sari shops come across? How many electronic shops you come across? All these are retail shops which will eventually shut down just because there will be one big giant electronic e-commerce company in Sri Lanka. And this is happening in other countries, but some countries are nicely countering it by exclusively doing e-commerce. That means letting everybody get on board fast before it's too late, where a giant can drive. So Grasshoppers is all about that, and this Eisenhower Fellowship will do nothing but really enhance and connect me with the global world to create this big movement of e-commerce. George Dilama serves as president of the Eisenhower Foundation, while retired General Colin Powell serves as its chairman. Eisenhower alumni include presidents, prime ministers, humanitarian leaders and Nobel laureates. Attending the prize giving of the Sri Chandra Nanda Buddhist School in Askiri Kandy President, Maitripal Sirisin expressed his views on individuals who spread extremism and incite racial tensions. We can see that certain media as well as social media outlets and websites are being used to incite racism in the country. Whoever it is, no matter what his position is and whatever the organization may be, if these parties act in a manner which affects the freedoms of the general public, then we need to question the civilness of these individuals and organizations. The principal of the school, Venerable Godagama Mangalathero, commented on a statement made about student uniforms. As a government, we have not reached a decision to change the uniforms. I need to state that I am a firm supporter of this uniform and I am also of the opinion that it should not change. With that, we wrap up Primetime News. I'm Bernadine Jassing. I'm Saturang Kapoor. Take care and good night.